Section three of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Selected Letters, Numbers fourteen and eighteen by Ludwig van Beethoven. As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 14. To Wegeler. Vienna, June twenty-ninth, 1800. My dear and valued Wegeler, How much I thank you for your remembrance of me, little as I deserve it, or have sought to deserve it, and yet you are so kind that you allow nothing, not even my unpardonable neglect, to discourage you, always remaining the same true, good, and faithful friend. That I can ever forget you or yours, once so dear and precious to me, do not for a moment believe. There are times when I find myself longing to see you again, and wishing that I could go to stay with you. My fatherland, that lovely region where I first saw the light, is still as distinct and beauteous in my eyes as when I quitted you. In short, I shall esteem the time when I once more see you, and again greet Father Rhine, as one of the happiest periods of my life. When this may be, I cannot yet tell, but at all events I may say that you shall not see me again till I have become eminent, not only as an artist, but better and more perfect as a man, and if the condition of our fatherland be then more prosperous, my art shall be entirely devoted to the benefit of the poor." O oh, blissful moment! How happy do I esteem myself that I can expedite it, and bring it to pass! You desire to know something of my position. Well, it is by no means bad. However incredible it may appear, I must tell you that Lichnowsky has been, and still is, my warmest friend. Slight dissensions occurred occasionally between us, and yet they only served to strengthen our friendship. He settled on me last year the sum of six hundred florins, for which I am to draw on him till I can procure some suitable situation. My compositions are very profitable, and I may really say that I have almost more commissions than it is possible for me to execute. I can have six or seven publishers or more for every piece, if I choose. They no longer bargain with me. I demand, and they pay. So you see this is a very good thing." For instance, I have a friend in distress, and my purse does not admit of my assisting him at once, but I have only to sit down and write, and in a short time he is relieved. I am also become more economical than formerly. If I finally settle here, I don't doubt I shall be able to secure a particular day every year for a concert, of which I have already given several. That malicious demon, however, bad health, has been a stumbling-block in my path. My hearing during the last three years has become gradually worse. The chief cause of this infirmity proceeds from the state of my digestive organs, which, as you know, were formerly bad enough, but have latterly become much worse, and being constantly afflicted with diarrhoea has brought on extreme weakness. Frank, director of the general hospital, drove to restore the tone of my digestion by tonics, and my hearing by oil of almonds, but, alas, these did me no good whatever. My hearing became worse, and my digestion continued in its former plight. This went on till the autumn of last year, when I was often reduced to utter despair. Then some medical assignus recommended me cold baths, but a more judicious doctor, the tepid ones of the Danube, which did wonders for me. My digestion improved, but my hearing remained the same, or in fact rather got worse. I did indeed pass a miserable winter. I suffered from most dreadful spasms, and sank back into my former condition. Thus it went on till about a month ago, when I consulted Faring, an army surgeon, under the belief that my maladies required surgical advice. Besides, I had every confidence in him. He succeeded in almost entirely checking the violent diarrhoea, and ordered me the tepid baths of the Danube, into which I pour some strengthening mixture. 
He gave me no medicine except some digestive pills four days ago, and a lotion for my ears. I certainly do feel better and stronger, but my ears are buzzing and ringing perpetually, day and night. I can with truth say that my life is very wretched. For nearly two years past I have avoided all society, because I find it impossible to say to people, I am deaf. In any other profession this might be more tolerable, but in mine such a condition is truly frightful. Besides, what would my enemies say to this? And they are not few in number. To give you some idea of my extraordinary deafness, I must tell you that in the theatre I am obliged to lean close up against the orchestra in order to understand the actors, and when a little way off I hear none of the high notes of instruments or singers. It is most astonishing that in conversation some people never seem to observe this. Being subject to fits of absence, they attribute it to that cause. I often can scarcely hear a person if speaking low. I can distinguish the tones, but not the words, and yet I feel it intolerable if any one shouts to me. Heaven alone knows how it is to end. Faring declares that I shall certainly improve, even if I be not entirely restored. How often have I cursed my existence! Plutarch led me to resignation. I shall strive, if possible, to set fate at defiance, although there must be moments in my life when I cannot fail to be the most unhappy of God's creatures. I entreat you to say nothing of my affliction to any one, not even to Lorchen. I confide the secret to you alone, and entreat you some day to correspond with Vering on the subject. If I continue in the same state, I shall come to you in the ensuing spring, when you must engage a house for me somewhere in the country, amid beautiful scenery, and I shall then become a rustic for a year, which may, perhaps, effect a change. Resignation! What a miserable refuge! And yet it is my sole remaining one. You will forgive my thus appealing to your kindly sympathies at a time when your own position is sad enough. Stefan Brüning is here, and we are together almost every day. It does me so much good to revive old feelings. He has really become a capital good fellow, not devoid of talent, and his heart, like that of us all, pretty much in the right place. I have very charming rooms at present, adjoining the Bastille, the ramparts, and peculiarly valuable to me on account of my health, at Baron Pascolatis. I do really think that I shall be able to arrange that Breuning shall come to me. You shall have your Antiochus, a picture, and plenty of my music besides, if indeed it will not cost you too much. Your love of art does honestly rejoice me. Only say how it is to be done, and I will send you all my works, which now amount to a considerable number, and are daily increasing. I beg you will let me have my grandfather's portrait as soon as possible by the post, in return for which I send you that of his grandson, your loving and attached Beethoven. It has been brought out here by Artaria, who, as well as many other publishers, has often urged this on me. I intend soon to write to Stoffeln, Christoph von Breuning, and plainly admonish him about his surly humour. I mean to sound in his ears our old friendship, and to insist on his promising me not to annoy you further in your sad circumstances. I will also write to the amiable Lorchen. Never have I forgotten one of you, my kind friends, though you did not hear from me, but you know well that writing never was my fort, even my best friends having received no letters from me for years. I live wholly in my music, and scarcely is one work finished when another is begun. Indeed, I am now often at work on three or four things at the same time. Do write to me frequently, and I will strive to find time to write to you also. Give my remembrances to all, especially to the kind Frau Hofreithen, von Breuning, and say to her that I am still subject to an occasional raptus. As for K, I am not at all surprised at the change in her. Fortune rolls like a ball and does not always stop before the best and noblest. As to Ries, court musician in Bonn, to whom pray cordially remember me, I must say one word. I will write to you more particularly about his son, Ferdinand, although I believe that he would be more likely to succeed in Paris than in Vienna, which is already overstocked, 
and where even those of the highest merit find it a hard matter to maintain themselves. By next autumn or winter I shall be able to see what can be done for him, because then all the world returns to town. Farewell, my kind, faithful Vegelar. Rest assured of the love and friendship of your Beethoven. End of letter number 14 Letter number 18 To Herr von Wegeler Vienna, November 16th, 1800 My dear Wegeler, I thank you for this fresh proof of your interest in me, especially as I so little deserve it. You wish to know how I am, and what remedies I use. Unwilling, as I always feel, to discuss this subject, still I feel less reluctant to do so with you than with any other person. For some months past Vering has ordered me to apply blisters on both arms, of a particular kind of bark, with which you are probably acquainted, a disagreeable remedy, independent of the pain, as it deprives me of the free use of my arms for a couple of days at a time, till the blisters have drawn sufficiently. The ringing and buzzing in my ears have certainly rather decreased, particularly in the left ear, in which the malady first commenced, but my hearing is not at all improved. In fact, I fear that it is become rather worse. My health is better, and after using the tepid baths for a time, I feel pretty well for eight or ten days. I seldom take tonics, but I have begun applications of herbs, according to your advice. Faring will not hear of plunge-baths, but I am much dissatisfied with him. He is neither so attentive nor so indulgent as he ought to be to such a malady. If I did not go to him, which is no easy matter, I should never see him at all. What is your opinion of Schmid, an army surgeon? I am unwilling to make any change, but it seems to me that Faring is too much of a practitioner to acquire new ideas by reading. On this point Schmidt appears to be a very different man, and would probably be less negligent with regard to my case. I hear wonders of galvanism. What do you say to it? A physician told me that he knew a deaf and dumb child whose hearing was restored by it, in Berlin, and likewise a man who had been deaf for seven years, and recovered his hearing. I am told that your friend Schmidt is at this moment making experiments on the subject. I am now leading a somewhat more agreeable life, as of late I have been associating more with other people. You could scarcely believe what a sad and dreary life mine has been for the last two years, my defective hearing everywhere pursuing me like a spectre, making me fly from every one, and appear a misanthrope, and yet no one is in reality less so. This change has been wrought by a lovely, fascinating girl, undoubtedly Giulietta, who loves me and whom I love. I have once more had some blissful moments during the last two years, and it is the first time I ever felt that marriage could make me happy. Unluckily she is not in my rank of life, and indeed at this moment I can marry no one. I must first bestir myself actively in the world. Had it not been for my deafness I would have travelled half round the globe ere now, and this I must still do. For me there is no pleasure so great as to promote and to pursue my art. Do not suppose that I could be happy with you. What indeed could make me happier? Your very solicitude would distress me. I should read your compassion every moment in your countenance, which would make me only still more unhappy. What were my thoughts amid the glorious scenery of my fatherland? The hope alone of a happier future, which would have been mine but for this affliction. Oh, I could span the world, were I only free from this. I feel that my youth is only now commencing. Have I not always been an infirm creature? For some time past my bodily strength has been increasing, and it is the same with my mental powers. I feel, though I cannot describe it, that I daily approach the object I have in view, in which alone can your Beethoven live. No rest for him. I know of none but in sleep, and I do grudge being obliged to sacrifice more time to it than formerly. Footnote 1. Were I only half cured of my malady, then I would come to you, and as a more perfect and mature man renew our old friendship. You should then see me as happy as I am ever destined to be here below, 
not unhappy. No, that I could not endure. I will boldly meet my fate. Never shall it succeed in crushing me. Oh, it is so glorious to live one's life a thousand times over. I feel that I am no longer made for a quiet existence. You will write to me as soon as possible. Pray try to prevail on Stefan, von Breuning, to seek an appointment from the Teutonic Order somewhere. Life here is too harassing for his health. Besides, he is so isolated that I do not see how he is ever to get on. You know the kind of existence here. I do not take it upon myself to say that society would dispel his lassitude, but he cannot be persuaded to go anywhere. A short time since I had some music in my house, but our friend Stephen stayed away. Do recommend him to be more calm and self-possessed, which I have in vain tried to effect. Otherwise he can neither enjoy health nor happiness. Tell me in your next letter whether you care about my sending you a large selection of music. You can indeed dispose of what you do not want, and thus repay the expense of the carriage, and have my portrait into the bargain. Say all that is kind and amiable from me to Lorchen, and also to Mamma and Christoph. You still have some regard for me? Always rely on the love as well as the friendship of your Beethoven. Footnote 1. Too much sleep is hurtful, is marked by a thick score in the Odyssey, 45, 393, by Beethoven's hand. See Schindler's Beethoven's Nachlass. End of letter number 18. End of section 3 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on June 29, 2007, in Oceanside, California.